Emerson, and he will speak on local global compatibility in the Seattle framework correspondence. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, so this is the first in a series of two talks, but I guess tomorrow's talk, at least as scheduled, is longer. So the idea is that somehow today should be some introduction and overview, and uh, tomorrow maybe we'll give some details of arguments. Um, and also, I mean, several people here, maybe many people here have seen versions of this talk before, and so it won't be so different. So I apologize for kind of repetition. Um, So, so what? So the chaotic wavelength program, I mean, it could have. I mean, it could mean many things, and probably does mean different things to to different people. But let me try and explain this kind of what I have in mind when I'm thinking about it. So. Uh, so s somehow, so one way to think about classical Langlands reciprocity is that Galois representations are in reciprocity with automorphic representations. So that's the kind of first approximative statement to classical language reciprocity. But then one should, uh, well, if one, I mean, there's many, many kind of caveats and points of care one should take if one wants to make this at all precise. But at least one is that here, perhaps one should think about Galois representations that are motivic. And here, one should think about automorphic representations which are algebraic. And so both of these can be characterized in some Hodge theoretic way, at least conjecturally. So, so motivic is uh, essentially the same as Duram in the sense of Fontaine's theory. Well, c I mean, c conjecturally, it's the same. So this is a conjecture. So, so maybe this is a, this is the Fontaine Mesa conjecture. Well, to be precise, uh, a Galois representation is conjectured to be motivic. An irreducible Galois representation into some piatic field is conjectured to be motivic if it's Durham at the primes above P, and I normified outside finitely many places. But let me focus, somehow for us, everything will always be unremified outside finitely many places. So I want to kind of focus on the, the sort of Hodge theoretic aspect. And again, algebraic, what does algebraic mean? Well, there's a precise, for any group, there's a precise local Langlands at the Archimedean primes, which allows one to attach Hodge numbers to an automorphic representation. An algebraic means having integral Hodge numbers. So again, here I mean sort of uh, this is some kind of metaphor for some kind of Archimedean local Langlands. But let me say it this way: that an algebraic, an algebraic automorphic form should have integral Hodge numbers. And so, so sort of both sides are the sort of the objects you want to have correspond on both sides. The cor sort of the, the objects that should correspond are dictated by Hodge theory of a kind of of a piatic kind and of an Archimedean kind. So, what does it mean to uh, to try and do piatic Langlands? So, uh, in piatic Langlands. One wants to interpolate both both sides periodically. So, so why you want to do this? Let's leave in. I mean, that's 
course, an interesting question why you would want to do this. But let me not, I mean, probably not so many people here need to be convinced. But anyway, uh, let me sort of leave that aside for the moment and just talk about uh, sort of what, what this means. So let's see if this will now go up. Oh. Ah. Okay, so that's this one. So this one will go up. Oh, is this as far down as it goes? Okay, so this is so it seems like we have this shadow here. Um, yes. Well, you need you need to be convinced. Yeah, uh, you'll be convinced. <laughs> just, just. No, but let let me let me somehow s say something about what this means. Um, so, um, so, so Galois representations naturally live they naturally live in piadic families so so. Because the Gawa group is is almost uh, it's almost profoundly presented, and essentially, from the point of view at least of its linear representations into GLN and periodic groups, it behaves as if it's profoundly presented. And so, so when you look at representations, how do they look? Well, if you have a finely presented group. It does have some representation variety. We have, to, we have to send the generators to some matrices, and we have to send the relations, meaning that some equations should be satisfying. And well, this is a, if it's pr sort of profinely presented, then furthermore, you should make sure that the, ex the profinite expressions converge. So your matrices should satisfy some inequalities. So there's just naturally a space of Galois representations. It's just there. I mean, how can you not see it? And how can you not think about it? So, that's, so it's some space, and we can draw it. We can draw it in as a three-dimensional space because that will turn out to be the relevant dimension for us later on. And inside there, we have these motivic representations. I won't draw them all, but they are. So it so it turns out, and this will be something we'll talk about in a little bit, that they're dense. There's risky dense in this space. So this is really a rigid analytic space. So if, we, if we're talking about uh, you're representing in uh, piadic matrix groups, then the, the inequalities we get to have, a, to have a continuous representation of piadic inequalities. And so we naturally cut out, you know, we, we have, you know, we're cutting this out in some, uh, we're kind of cutting out in some space of matrices with kind of inequalities, piadic inequalities on the coefficients. So we get a rigid analytic space. And, uh, and so sort of one thing you see is that, I mean, since these motivic points are are dense. The furthermore, one knows that uh, they're, sort of, they're dense in a neighborhood of each point. So each point has a dense set of motivic points around it. So, they, so these points are accreting on each other. So they're in some way talking to each other. So just from, the, just from the point of view that they kind of communicate with each other in some sense in this space, that already makes it natural to ask how the Langlands correspondence respects, you know, the kind of lines of communication that exist already on the left-hand side. So that's a kind of a first answer to your question. So it's a, so there's a yeah so there's a precise theorem for the two-dimensional case which I'll state in a little bit. So yes. So one so more generally one would hope it's always true if you're looking at representations of into a um, so if you're looking at representations into into the L group of some group which emits discrete series, then one ex hopes this would always be true. Uh, sorry, and I should say, and you're looking at representations which are odd in a certain sense. So odd is odd is the condition it turns out to be the condition this space is as large in dimension as possible. 
Yes, oh, yes, you would need that. So somehow what's important, well, well, so the actual proof of this, of course, uses many contingent facts. But what seems to be ultimately important about this situation is that I'm, I'm secretly thinking about odd representations and, uh, and GL2 of the real numbers emits discrete series. Yeah, there's a risky dense, but there's sort of somehow. But for example, if you take at least a, a crystalline point, it's sort of even better than risky dense. It really has, if you take a neighborhood, like a, there's a periodic ball around that, that ball will have lots of other crystalline points inside. Mm. It's not so clear to me, just off hand, because so for GL one, we'll be looking at uh, so for GL one, we're just looking at representations of ZP star. Getting to it. Oops. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that helped. So keep you by star, and so the. Um, yeah, so then we're looking at, uh, no, yeah, so let me, yeah, so let me come back to Richard's remark in a moment. So, yes, yeah, so of course there are, yes, there are regions without points, but so here we're looking at the, the sort of algebraic points out of the form uh, sort of x goes to, Some final order character times x to the k, where this is an integer. So, uh, so z p star is um, is some product. It's non-canonically some finite product of z p's. And so, oops, let me try again. Rather, it's z. I mean, it's non-canonically z p plus a finite group. So that uh, the space of characters, so the space of chi equals a, a union of disks. So we have this finite group gives us some finite union of disks, a character of ZP. You just have to say where the generator goes. So you have to give yourself one invertible matrix. But then the con continuity condition tells you that matrix should be somewhat close to the identity. So you get these disks. And then. We have these points. So they're, right, they're sort of, well, so like for example, if you take k equals 0, then we're just talking about the generator should go to a root of unity. So we get this line of, discrete line of roots of unity wandering out to the boundary. But then putting in all these k's somehow makes the things ris risky dense in this rigid space. But yes, if you're right, of course, Richard's right that they're big open sets. I mean, if we look at some, uh, if we look at some region in this disk where the log is some non-integer point, then that point will, uh, you know, that will not be one of these characters. And then there'll be some small neighborhood which contains no integers. But somehow, yeah, somehow nevertheless these points sort of, yeah, yeah somehow these points are thick. On, for example, for, for a given integer, there are lots of other, I mean, arbitrarily large integers that are kind of periodically arbitrarily close to it. So around one of these points, there are lots of other nearby points periodically. So, um, so, yeah, and so somehow the picture for the picture for for uh, two-dimensional representations of of the Galois group of Q. You should imagine some, somehow something like this, but these will be three-dimensional, as, as it turns out. So, so what what is supposed to correspond on on the right-hand side? Well, unfortunately, nobody has a good definition of periodic automorphic form. Where, by good, I have something in something in mind. I mean, if so for, some ver so for somebody's notion of good, there is a good notion of periodic modular form. But in particular, what's important in the Langlands program is that you have representation theory on this side. I mean, that's a big, 
kind of part, sort of a big feature of the Highlands program. And so if you look at, for example, the theory of periodic modular forms as developed by Serre and Katz and uh, Dwork, Hitter, there's, you can certainly, in this theory, you can make uh, GO2 of QL act if L is different from P. But it doesn't seem that you have GO2 of QP acting in this picture. And on the other hand, sort of the local action on this side is at the prime P. For example, it's at the prime P is a pivot on which the Fontaine-Maser conjecture turns. And so by not having the prime P appear representation theoretically on the, on, in periodic modular forms, it's hard, to, um, it's hard to see how you could, that you could really call that you know, precise kind of Langlands picture. So, um, so the question is, can you find some... Can you find something on the right-hand side which uh, naturally, which has some claim by virtue of its nature to be something automorphic, which on the other hand has representation theory of GO2QP, and which also has some chance to connect to the left-hand side in, in a reasonable way. So, so the last uh, kind of general re remark I'll make about sort of in these generalities before I state something more precise, is that, so having just maligned the classical theory of periodic modular forms, I mean, of course, one should also praise it. And I just want to talk about one aspect of that theory which Hitter identified, which was a concept of ordinary forms. Not to promote them above others, but just to say that the condition of ordinarity is an interesting condition from the point of view of classical Langlands. Because it mixes a Satake parameter at P and an Archimedean parameter, and it says something about the connection between the two. And so, sort of that's some hint that in a kind of piatic theory, the prime P will kind of play the role in the classical theory of both the prime P and the prime infinity. So, uh, so one already sees that in the, just in the theory of uh, Hecker characters, that if you have a Hecker character and you make the associated piatic Gower representation, you kind of do this thing where you move information at the prim Archimedean prime to the prime p. So, so we want so that's kind of a, f a feature to look for, and if that's happening, if you see that, then you maybe have a hint that you've found something in the right direction. So, okay. Well, maybe this picture. I mean, it's we can erase this picture. So, um, so I think my colleague, uh, Professor Caligari, already gave some lectures on this topic. So I can uh, maybe I don't have to say too much, but. What I want to describe is um, quick, just kind of write down, is uh, the periodically completed cohomology of modular curves, which I'm going to offer as a kind of makeshift candidate for a space of automorphic forms. So, so let's uh, fix. of prime sigma containing P. So P is always our fixed prime that's the P in the in the word piatic. So we have a I'll write sigma naught to be sigma with P removed. And I want to uh, define the following space. So we're going to look at the uh, cohomology, the first cohomology of modular curves from level P to the R. Uh, and then some other level N, which I'll describe in a moment. 
coefficients in O. So here, so here O is the integers in some final extension of QP. And this E is just the coefficient field. So morally, this E is QP bar, except that once we start doing periodic completions and so on, QP bar is a little bit dangerous. And CP is also even, in some sense, even more dangerous. So we'll always have in mind a, f a fixed but arbitrary coefficient field E, which we're willing to change at any time if it helps us. So we take this cohomology. So this is the cohomology of the module curve at this level PTR times N coefficients in O. And now, in fact, we uh, take a limit, a direct limit over R. And so we fix a level away from P, but we have all levels at P. This is now some kind of countably generated O module. We periodically complete. So now we've periodically completed a countably generated O module. So depending on what we had, for example, QP is a countably generated ZP module. And when you periodically complete that, you get 0. On the other hand, a countable direct sum of copies of ZP is a, uh, periodically is a countably generated ZP module, which when you complete, you get a kind of Tate type thing. You get like a, a you know, C0 space over ZP. You get sequences of elements in ZP that tend to 0. So roughly, this will be kind of one or the other, depending on whether you get any divisibilities as you go up the tower. And it turns out it'll be like the latter one. So it turns out that this completion won't kill anything off. And so if you imagine this is some kind of countable direct sum of copies of ZP, then this completion, you have a good picture of what it's like. So and then having done that, we'll now take a direct limit over n, where here, and now just to involve sigma. So here, n uh, ranges over natural numbers. whose prime divisors lie in sigma naught. So I just put in the levels at sigma naught. And this whole thing we will call h1 hat. Uh, we have coefficients in O at the prime sigma, or at involving the primes in sigma. So. Well, so it, somehow you could ask why this limit is outside the completion. The answer is it wouldn't somehow make so much difference to put that limit inside the completion because it involves levels away from P. But, uh, but since it wouldn't involve so much, it wouldn't complicate things much to put it inside, it's just simpler to anyway to leave it outside from the beginning. So that here, think we have kind of a theory that's going to be, sort of, so to speak, smooth away from P but not smooth at the prime p. But for that to make sense, we should exactly say exactly what acts on everything here. So what acts? Well, of course, when I take this cohomology, I mean, I can, if I like, I can call it Atel cohomology over q bar. And so we have an action of the Galois group of q. And we uh, have an action of GL2QP, because we put in all the primes P. We have an action of GL2QL for every L in sigma naught. So I'm going to, I'll just write them out here. So we have a product for L in sigma naught of GL2QL. So I just want to single out P, because that's going to play an important role. And we also have a Hecke algebra. So there's a Hecke algebra that acts on the whole picture. So this is the Hecke algebra. So this is uh, it's um, topologically generated by the T uh, L for L not in sigma. So exactly what is this? Well, 
if we work at some level here, we have the Hecker algebra generated by these Hecker operators with coefficients in O. And then their projective limit acts on, on this limit. So that's what the T is. So it's a projective limit of, uh, that's a projective limit of uh, finite O algebra. Oh, yes, in fact, it's a good idea. Let's put them in. Late, later, I'm going to localize it an irreducible, at a prime ideal with an irreducible uh, row bar, and then they will be in automatically. But yeah, it makes sense to put them in. A priori. Thank you. So, So, oops. Uh, uh, this is okay. So this is really sorry. So it doesn't go any lower. So hopefully there, there was nothing important on the bottom line. Uh, yeah. So we don't need to in, have a local system that will be incorporated. So, uh, so in fact, yeah. So maybe we can. I can sort of just write it down. So this T. Is the inverse limit. So this is the uh, this is a finite L algebra generated by the T L acting on that H one. So so each of these is a product of local pieces. So this whole T is a projective limit of projective limits is just a project some big projective limit. So this is a product. Of uh, complete local rings, a typical one of which I'll denote TM. So, I mean, in fact, not just rings, but O algebras. And as it turns out, these are sort of complete local O algebras. And as it turns out, these are going to be Noetherian of could I mention four. So the Netherian, and they have cruel dimension four, which is one plus three. So I think the fact that the Netherian is not obvious just from the construction as a projective limit of these finite type algebras. So I don't know a purely kind of automorphic way to see that they're Netherian. And the fact that they have cool dimension four is, I think, not at all not obvious at all. Um, but this four, the reason I wrote it as one plus three is that this one is because of O has cool dimension one, and this three is the three-dimensional box I drew before. So that's where uh, this one plus three comes from. Well, each of these is a product, and then in the limit is sort of compatible. So I guess. You can just get, I mean, the product structure is going to be uh, sort of. Well, I haven't taken, I think that's, on, unless I'm confused, I'm just thinking about on the level of rings, I have some finite product, and then some bigger finite product, and then some bigger finite product. And a, so I'm sort of taking a projective limit of these finite projective limits, and that's just one big product of the individual projective limits. But I think if I take specs, I, mean, I, I didn't say anything about specs. So I think that's OK. So well, I don't think I've said anything that, imp that uses that yet. Because I'm not saying it's a finite product. It uh, could be a countable product. Maybe I'm just wrong. I mean, I'm just thinking. I have this product. I have maybe more things, and they, that these map to this. Well, 
So this, this is defined to be the projective limit. So if I just, I mean, I had F, I could have FP, and then I could have FP cos FP mapping to FP, and then FP cos FP cos FP mapping down, and then the projective limit, I would have a countable product of FPs. That's all I'm thinking of. So, uh, so now we can, uh, so, So each, I should say that each, each TM, so each uh, maximum ideal gives rise to some rho bar, which depends on the maximum ideal M, taking GQ to GL2 of uh, to GL2 of the residue field. Which is a semi simple and, of course, satisfies the famous relationship of the characteristic polynomial of uh, Frobenius at L is equal to x squared minus TL x plus SL times L. So, this is uh, the famous construction of Deline. Just for me, Frobenius is always geometric Frobenius. And then I choose this one to be the one so that this is true. Uh, so then, so I'm, so we could equally well, I mean, this, this row bar determines the maximal ideal. In fact, if I hand you a row bar, you can try and produce a maximal ideal by sort of via these equations. And you either get a maximal ideal or else you get the unit ideal if that row bar didn't come from any M. So, and there's a famous theorem of, well, some of Tare and Vincent Vajay that, in fact, says conjecture that all these row bars, any, any odd such row bar does come from, from such an M. So, so, we have, uh, so we have kind of a good relation between the M's and the row bars. But for now, I want to think that I'm kind of fixing, really, that I'm kind of starting on the modular curve side. So I have this M, and it gives me the row bar. But I'll label things by the row bar rather than by the M, because that's sort of what we want to have foremost in our mind. So we have H1 hat, sorry, H1 hat O sigma row bar uh, equals the... Uh, the projection onto the TM factor of H1 O sigma. So T ha has this product structure, this H1 hat sort of has it gets an analogous product structure. And we can take the factor corresponding to uh, this particular M. But, and I'll label it by the row bar, because I really want to focus on the row bar. And I'll, I'll write, I'll also as well as TM, I'll write T of row bar, just to again focus on the row bar. And because later, to dis we, uh, so one goal is to describe this, and there'll be assumptions, and the assumptions will be assumptions on row bar. So it's kind of convenient to, to just label everything by row bar. So, 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 so the goal is to explicitly describe this H1 hat O sigma rho bar as a module over the Hecker ring and GQ and GL2QP and uh, 
the DL2QL. Well, whatever exactly explicitly means, but that's the goal. And so, so such a description sort of, well, would, let me say both would and should be an interpolation of the uh, local global compatibility in cohomology of modular curves due to, well, Leyland's Deline and uh, of course completed by Carriol. So, so when I say would and should, I mean if we do it the right way, then it will be somehow. So we want to try and emulate. That's what, our, what we want to emulate. So, so what do, what does the uh, kind of local global reciprocity law of uh, of Langlois and Carriol say? It says that when we take the cohomology, well, at least if we take the cuspidal part, it breaks up as a direct sum indexed by Gawa representations. In fact, the indexing is in a very simple way. You have a Gawa representation that has a multiplicity space. And, that's, and then that multiplicity space no longer has an action of the Gawa representation, but it has an action of what's left. And you describe that representation in terms of the Gawa action, so in terms of the Gawa representation you begin with, and local length. So that's, uh, so that's sort of what we would like to generalize. And uh, that's what the local global compatibility statement will, will generalize. So, so to do that, To do that, we need candidates. I mean, we need to know what the local Langlands should be. We also need to know what the Gower representations will be. So, so one thing we can say is that we kind of can imagine what Gower representations should appear here. Because if I fix, uh, well, so this is not, what I'm going to say now is not going to be a complete argument, but it's at least a, gives a reasonable uh, approximation to one, which is that before we put on the hat, we had some space on which the Gawa group was acting sort of through a sum of two-dimensional representations. Now when you put on this hat, somehow you, you produce more elements with more Gawa action. But all these two-dimensional representations are constrained to live in this box that I drew at the beginning. So that box should constrain altogether how they can interpolate. And so, so the idea is that we shouldn't see any more Gower action here than we get by taking all the two-dimensional representations attached to classical modular forms and then kind of closing them up inside the space of all Gower representations. In particular, we shouldn't suddenly see a seven-dimensional Gower representation appearing, among other things. So that's, so that's sort of one thing. So we have a kind of, that's a candidate for how the Gower action would look. So let's try and say to conjecture. So, So let me call rho universal the universal representation, Gawa representation over that box that I drew at the beginning. And let me assume for now that the, uh, the classical representations are dense so that I can think of that box as being the, uh, the originality of space attached to this T of rho bar. So this is a two-dimensional representation over T of rho bar. And that's the kind of what you might naively expect you're getting as a Gawa 
kind of for the Gower representations. In particular, it's no longer reasonable to think this will be a direct sum. It's, well, I mean, either think of this heuristically as some kind of direct integral over the spec of this room. So. So, so late, so, so when we make statements, I'm going to assume this row bar is irreducible. So let me even assume now that row bar is absolutely irreducible as an assumption. Otherwise, yes, otherwise the whole question becomes more delicate. So it's better maybe to assume from now on that row bar is irredu absolutely irreducible, since certainly when we state results, it will be. And then we really have a nice sort of moduli problem. So we have this universal row. And now we need to have a candidate representation for this, uh, for dual 2 QP. And so uh, Pierre Colmez has, I think, been giving lectures about this. So the Piatic local Langlands for dual 2 QP says that if I have a family of two-dimensional uh, Gawa representations of the local Gawa group at P, there's a corresponding family of Banach space representations or Banach module representations of GL2 of QP. So let's call that pi P. Uh, yeah, so I don't know what, what the best notation is. So let me write it as pi P of rho universal, restricted G of QP. But this is, so this is something kind of new. I mean, this is Piatic local length. So this should be some uh, Balak module over this complete Ethereum local ring. And then what we should have left should be some representation of, uh, of these groups. So let me just for a moment call it X. This will be some kind of completed tensor product. Here I didn't need to say completed because this is just free of rank two. And so this is really just as a module, it's just a direct sum of two copies of this. But here this, this will be infinite dimensional, this is infinite dimensional, so I should be careful about what I mean when I write down tensor product. So this X is some representation, this X is some representation of uh, the product of these GL2 QLs. And Yes, so it should be completed because, so let me just get this straight. So it should be completed in a weak sense that th this will be a limit of, this will be a, a, uh, representation of the, a smooth representation of these groups. And I, I want to take a completion where I first of all take the invariance under some compact open subgroup. But then that tensor product is a priori not complete and that should be completed. And then I take a limit. So, th so this is some... Yeah, so this is supposed to be some kind of curly hat, which is some weak kind of a completion. But again, I'd rather not def sort of write it down now. It's, um, and, and this, so this, so here where this, sorry, it's again over the T row bar. Yeah, which is the same as TM, so T row bar equals TM. So, so here where, so here I want to say that X interpolates classical local Langlands for uh, the dual 2 QL. But this, X, but this interpolation is by itself also, although it kind of has a very different flavor to this and maybe more, ele more elementary given what we know, it's not a completely trivial point either. So, um, so I'll let me just sort of say something about what happens here. And it's one of the things you have to think about in this space is imagine you have a family of uh, Gower representations and imagine that they're coming from, imagine that they all, uh, so L here is a prime different from P, but imagine they're all really semi-stable at L. So you have some family of, uh, of extensions of the, uh, Trivial representation by the cyclotomic representation, if you like, which is non-trivial. But it degenerates to the split extension. And think what happens on 
local Langlands. You have a family of twists of Steinberg. They're generating, well, what would local Langlands put at the special point? It will put a one-dimensional representation. So clearly, that's not going to happen in this space. So first of all, you should replace this one-dimensional representation by the induction of which it's a Langlands quotient. So the first thing one has to do when you think about this x is you have to, um, you have to kind of modify local Langlands so it's no longer a correspondence between irreducible things, but it's just an arrow from Gawa to, to GL2, where in the image of the arrow, you allow, you allow reducible objects, but you insist that everything be generic. So you basically replace all Langlands quotients by the induction of which they were a Langlands quotient. So that's sort of a first step. This, another remark is that they never appear classically. I mean, classically, you'll never see this one-dimensional local language appearing attached to a cusp form because cusp forms have Whitaker models. But they can appear periodically. They could appear as a limit. So somehow, so you never had to confront this issue classically, but now you do, and so you have to kind of, first of all, do that. Then you have a second problem, that now when you look at this family of Steinbergs going to this limit, which is now an induction, well, how big a is that induction. It's an extension of trivial by Steinberg. So it has one more dimension. Of course, everything's countable dimensional, but in some well-defined sense, it has one extra dimension. And so this x will kind of not be free. So you have to kind of deal with that issue. If you like, this is, I think, why in Weil's argument in proof of Fermat, he had to shift always to a Hecker algebra where TL equals 0. So somehow the Krilov models, the kind of the Schwartz spaces will always, the kind of compactly supported part of the Krilov model, that will always be free. But you can get some Jacquet module that varies over the family, and that's not free. So you kind of, so there's some kind of complication there. And then finally, let's think about what kind of a module this is as a T module. Of course, it's going to be infinitely generated. But still, morally, does it look like sort of a finite type T module? And the answer is clearly no, because it's full of torsion. Every classical eigenform is a T torsion object. So this module is full of T torsion. It was written as a projective limit of sort of T torsion modules. So, so, so for Iwasawas in the audience, you'll know that in Iwasawa theory, you kind of have a free side and a co free side. When you see objects with lots of torsion, you know you're probably on the co free side. So here we're sort of on the co free side from the point of view of T modules. So, Somehow, again, this x will sort of not be a free t object. It will be kind of a co-free object. So that's one reason why I don't want to write it down precisely now, because to describe what this x should be is a little complicated for all these reasons. Yeah? Is this question is empty? So if sigma is empty, this will just be the Homs, the, the O continuous, I mean, give t its emetic topology, it will be the O, con, o Homs, the Homs is O modules, continuous Homs is O modules from t to O. So we'll be sort of replacing T by its dual, which kind of takes all these free objects and makes them co-free somehow. So even, so even when sigma naught's empty, this has some, plays some role. and makes the right-hand side have the right flavor to have a chance to be the left-hand side. So, so, so somehow we'll see in tomorrow's lecture when you want to try and prove these kind of statements, at least how I, well, I'm going to try and prove them is, there's all this, there's a lot of duality. There's a lot of flipping back and forth between different sides because of this free versus co-free business. So, um, okay, so that's the kind of, the sort of conjecture one's aiming at. And so, uh, and now if you have such a conjecture, what could you do with it? Well, you could choose a particular you could choose a particular lift of row bar. And that gives you a particular, well, it gives you a particular prime ideal here. And you could take the torsion for that prime ideal. And here you're, you're getting an eigenspace. So you're getting eigenspace with some system of Hecker eigenvalues. And over here, you can read off what the eigenspace is. You'll just get the row, it, you'll get the row, the lift you chose, and you'll get the local Langlands the periodic local Langlands attached to the lift you chose. And you'll get some sort of product of local Langlands away from P for the lift you chose. And for example, now you could try and prove theorems. Because you could ask yourself, 
suppose that the uh, lift I chose was Duram. And I can look at the eigenspace. Well, I'd like to know that it was classical. Well, I'm looking in cohomology, so we're not, I, it's a bit ambitious, and I'm not, we'll be a bit ambitious to try and hope to see weight one forms in some classical way in cohomology. So let me assume that I choose a, a Duram lift with distinct Hodge Tate weights. So it has a chance to con correspond to a, a, a weight a modular form that you could see in cohomology. So you could take that lift and you could look at the eigenspace and then you could try and see what, what you know about it. And what you know about it, the theorem of Pierre Comez, is that this factor, the Banach space attached to a Duram row with distinct Hodge Tate weights, has locally has locally algebraic vectors in it. And so the eigenspace has some locally algebraic vectors. But then there's a theorem that all the locally algebraic vectors come from the classical cohomology, maybe with twisted coefficients. And so you've discovered that your Duram lift had to come from a modular form. And so you've proved the case of the fontaine mazur conjecture. So this is a sort of another answer to, to Peter's question is, just like anything else in mathematics, if you enlarge the solution space a priori, you can hope to have a statement, and then you can sort of look for conditions on solutions to cut down to something you're more interested in. So here we can try and understand the classical case by first of all enlarging our, perspe you know, enlarging our perspective. And in particular, I mean, in this way, one will get sort of the first proofs of, of fontaine mesa type results for, for say, representations which are supercustodial locally at p. And one needs the whole input to do that. I mean, somehow, those things that are supercustodial at p, a priori, you don't know anything about kind of what the eigenspace for is in this here until after you've done this whole thing. So, so you really kind of genuinely have to go to the whole, it seems at the moment, to the whole p-adic world and sort of have it swallow everything and then look back at the kind of particular points you're interested in. So, so that's sort of, so there, there are, I think, lots of motivations for proving this conjecture, but that's at least one motivation. Is it? So it gives you a route to proving cases of the fontaine mazur conjecture. Yes, the inner natural duality. So the, so the advantage of working with homology is that then you don't have this co-free business. Everything looks free. The disadvantage is that then everything classical is a quotient and not a sub. And that's, I think, you know, for reasons of human psychology, it's somehow nice to have the classical things be sub-objects. And again, locally algebraic is, you know, locally algebraic is about some vectors in the space and some subspace of locally algebraic vectors. So well, those kind of properties just become, you know, kind of contorted on the other side. So in fact, I think it's best to have both homology and cohomology in mind, and you realize you can just go from one to the other by duality. And all the time in arguments, one sort of just chooses a side that you want to be on for, yeah, you, you just be fickle. You're on whatever side is helpful at the moment. But you're willing to change sides at any time. So, so let me state a kind of a precise th well, a theorem now. So let's suppose, so just to emphasize, that rho bar is, so let me get all hypotheses straight. So, rho, so, so I'll, 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 state, um, I'll state everything at once, I think, just to make life a bit easier. So let's suppose that p is greater than 2, that rho bar restricted to that you restricted G, G, Q, would join a P through of unity, that this is absolutely reducible. So this is the, uh, this is the Taylor-Wiles condition, that rho bar locally at P doesn't have either of the following shapes. So 
So it's not a twist minus star zero one. That's not a twist of one star zero mod p cyclotomic. Where here star could be zero or not. So I, I just don't want it to. I don't want it. I don't want the semi simplification to be uh, two characters that coincide, and I don't want it to be an extension of well, up to a twist, an extension of the mob p cycloid by the trivial. I, I exclude those cases. Tensor with, with a character, yes. Yes. Uh, so then, so then now let me just use the standard symbols that all the Deformation, Gower deformation theory people here know. So by R rho bar sigma naught, I mean the deformation ring of rho bar for representations that are unramified outside sigma naught. Oh, sorry, plus, I mean sigma, unramified outside sigma. So um, you have no conditions at the primes away from P, and in particular, no condition at P. Now, the no conditions away from P is not so extreme because, for example, the, the conductor, the wild conductor can't change when you away from P, the wild conductor is constant when you reduce mod P. So there's, so sort of, when you, so when you're looking at lifts of rho bar, when you look at the behavior away from P, all that can happen is that some JK module you had downstairs can disappear upstairs somehow. So that's not so extreme, but no condition at P means you allow, you mean you don't have Durham, you don't have any fixed Hodge Tate weight, so that gives you these big, you know, three-dimensional boxes. But in fact, in this case, this is known. So this is essentially, so this is essentially a theorem. This is essentially. Yes, not the other way. Kissin has the other way. So this, yeah. So essentially, so this is essentially due to Gavea, Mesa, and and gave her Berkeley. So this is an, this is an, uh, a, so this has nothing to, I mean, this argument has nothing to do with the methods I've been talking about. It's a Taylor Wiles kind of an argument. I also remarked that somehow the bigger R is the easier the Taylor Wiles arguments become, especially if you think about them from Kissin's point of view. Because for Kissin's point of view, all the difficulty in a Taylor Wiles argument comes from the singularities in the local deformation space at P. But unrestrict, unrestricted deformation spaces at P are essentially always smooth. And so, uh, so somehow, so it, it, you sort of make your life technically much easier if, you're, if, you don't, if you don't impose any conditions at the prime P, it becomes easier to prove such theorems. So we have, so we have this, and then we have an isomorphism, H1 hat uh, O, Sigma rho bar is isomorphic to, so we have the rho universal. I'm going to write, uh, so this is not O, this is theta tensor x, this is all over T rho bar. This is this kind of weak completion where here, so this is. as in the conjecture. So maybe in, in tomorrow's talks, I'll be able to say more precisely what this x is. Uh, this row universal is a row universal. What is this theta? Well, this theta is morally that pi p. But this space, this row restricted to GQP may not be, it may not have trivial endomorphisms. The, the, I mean, the, the row bar locally at, locally at P, even, even though row bar is irreducible, locally at P it may be reducible and may be a split extension and so have non-trivial endomorphisms. And so then the moduli space is really a stack, which means you can't recognize a family just by the points. So in some sense in here we know a lot of classical points, but we can't really tell what family they interpolate into. So this is some family interpolating the points, which fiber by fiber agrees with this. But we don't know it's exactly that. So this is some T 
Banach module with the same fibers over T rho bar as, as what local Langlands will give. Let me put that up so that you have some chance to see it. So this theta is some Banach module over the Hecker ring, with a, sorry with with a with a GL two QP action. So it's a, I mean it's a nice it's the right kind of an object. It's an admissible Banach module over this Hecker ring with a GL two QP act with this GL two QP action. Yes. No, rho unif, rho unif. Then you restrict. Yeah, I have the fam I have the the global fam I have the family of global Gower representations. But then, that gives me a family of local Gower representations, and at each point there's a Banach space. And and and, and fiber by fiber, they're the right Banach space, but they're glued together into some family, which you just see somehow we're going to produce this family fiber by fiber. So we just don't know that it's the right family. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, and so and then this conjecture, then this statement will be enough for uh, if you have a row lifting such a row bar, then this will be enough to make the sort of argument for Fontaine Mesa that I described go through. Because somehow, if, if you're computing eigenspaces, I mean, this has all the right fibers, so it so the argument goes through. And if and if this row bar has trivial endomorphisms locally at p then this has no choice but to be the correct object because then there's no ambiguity. So, okay, so I think I'm finished. I'm out of time, so let me stop there. Uh, we don't need a bit, I guess, if we, yeah, here we could have QP, but later if we want to uh, choose a row that lifts and the row takes values in E, we should just have E. So just to, to have that flexibility later, it's better to just have given you all the definitions with E. But, but yeah, of course, it plays no role. It plays absolutely no role. Um, no, so the second hypothesis is, so first of all, if we're willing to just not have this, if we're willing to just prove it work over T rho bar and just use the, mo the universal modular definition, deformation, then we, just, then we don't need this, this hypothesis. We just need that rho bar is irreducible. And then if you want to go further, <coughs> then you're talking about handling the Eisenstein case. So then, well, you know as well as I do because you were in Kenya, but it's lecture in Barcelona, that the structure is much more complicated. That you don't seem to get a that you don't seem to get a tensor product of local factors of single local factors. But I mean, right, we saw his talk. You can have all kinds of weird extra Steinberg factors appearing. So it seems that when Ro so it, there's some hope that you could prove some statement like this for a reducible row bar, trying to emulate the argument of Skinner and Wiles, who who do something similar for Hitter families. That's in the case of Hitter families. And then if you could do that. You might then hope to prove something weaker than this, but perhaps enough to give Fontaine Mesa. So I guess, I mean, Kissen and I have entertained this hope for, for some years now, but I think our children got in the way of trying to really fulfill it so far, of, um, of trying to at least, you know, kind of push, push these methods through to try and prove uh, Fontaine Mesa, you know, with kind of no ramification restrictions and robots reducible results, at least in that direction. But the precise statement is, um, well, because I haven't told you exactly what X is, I'm, I'm kind of obfuscating slightly. But the precise statement when row bar is reducible will really be more complicated. Because here, what's going to happen is when we reduce mod P, at least and this X is going to be really a tensor product of, of local pieces attached to the row bar locally at all the L's. But I think that Ken Ribbett's examples in, from Barcelona show this is just not true. As far as I can understand, they show this is not true in the, in the Eisenstein case. That 
this, this piece is really more complex. So, um, and I should say, like, I think one reason to kind of ponder the Eisenstein case is because if you think about endoscopic cases on higher rank groups, they probably, you know, the Eisenstein case for GL2 is maybe not a bad kind of testing ground for what could happen if you're looking at kind of, you know, interpolating where you hit an endoscopic loci in, in higher rank groups. So I don't think this Eisenstein case, I, th I think this Eisenstein case is interesting and, you know, worth investigating, but I think it's more complex. Thank you.